Alrighty, I think it's about time for us to get started. It's good to see everyone tonight. Glad that we are uh, in here and not out there. I'll tell you what though, we have missed a lot of what a lot of other parts of the state are going through, I think, so that's at least a blessing. It might get a little icy, but uh, here at DFW and several other places are having a lot worse than we are. Uh, we have a few announcements as we get started tonight. Um, I do, uh, first of all, want to mention Miss Ella um, is in BSA, I believe was uh, the last we heard. Um, don't know exactly what's going on yet uh, with her, but um, it might be COVID or something along those lines. Just not really sure. So uh, keep her uh, in your prayers. She's, uh, of course, had a hard time for a while now. Um, we uh, are thankful, though, that uh, Garrett and Brittany um, should be home now. They were about 10 minutes away when I texted Garrett at 6 o'clock, so uh, they should be back home uh, by this point and um, are uh, <laughs> going to be able to kind of adjust and sit back and be like, what just happened? So uh, uh, we're thankful for that, and uh, we continue praying that everything goes well with them. I got to see um, little Libby, uh, I guess, what was it, Thursday of this week, and she is the most adorable little baby. So uh, we're excited for uh, Eric and, and Casey as well. And uh, uh, do want to mention, if we're if uh, you have not had a chance to uh, throw in a, a bag of diapers or wipes or something and you still want to do that, we're going to be delivering that next week. So if you can get that in by Sunday night, um, just wanted to give you a heads up, we will be delivering that soon. Uh, let's see. Tomorrow morning, um, normally we would have Lay's Bible class at 10 o'clock. However, uh, we are canceling that um, for tomorrow morning, um, primarily because of uh, the, the different um, arrangements for uh, Linda Jane's, the meal and the funeral and so forth, so that we don't interfere with that. And also, it might not be a good condition to get out tomorrow anyway as it's shaping up. So uh, either way, that is canceled for tomorrow. We'll resume that uh, as normal next week. I believe that is all the announcements. Is there anything that I miss before we get started? All right. Denny, Denny Wilson's mother is okay. not doing well. Okay. Denny Wilson's mother is not doing well. Okay. Denny Wilson's mother is not doing well. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Denny Wilson's mother. So we want to uh, keep her in the prayers as well. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then uh, we will get into Proverbs. Our Lord God in heaven, Father, as we are gathered here, we reflect on how blessed we are, how blessed we are to be your people, how blessed we are to have your word, how blessed we are to have uh, just the, uh, the support and the, uh, the opportunities that exist within your family and the uh, opportunities as well to minister to those who are in need, uh, both of our number and those in our community. Father, we know that there are many right now who are going through very difficult times. We pray for the Wilson family as uh, uh, Danny's mother is uh, uh, having a, a difficult time right now. We pray for them. Uh, we pray also for Miss Ella. Uh, we pray that uh, whatever is going on with her may be uh, discovered and resolved quickly and that she can uh, be able to return to her normal routine. Uh, Father, we are uh, mindful also of those who have recently uh, have new additions to their family. We're so thankful that Gary and Brittany have been able to come home, and we're also uh, thankful that uh, uh, the uh, delivery of uh, Libby has been uh, has uh, went well, and uh, that Eric and Casey have been doing well uh, with their family as well. Uh, Father, we know that there are many more that uh, we are mindful of as we are uh, going through uh, uh, each week. Father, we have so many that are in our bulletin and elsewhere, but. Lord, we just know that you are aware of everyone, even those that we have never heard of, that we've never met, that you are watching over all, that you care for all. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, the Janes family as well, as they will be mourning the loss of a loved one tomorrow, and uh, we pray that we may minister to them. In all things, Father, we ask that uh, you would watch over us, you would give us strength, and you would give us the determination to uh, do your will, uh, not only uh, in the study of it, but also in the application of it in our lives. Father, we pray all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. <clears throat> all right. If you remember last week, we talked about marriage, and somehow I am discussing that topic again. Uh, as I said last week, I am eminently qualified for this discussion. <coughs> no. But that being said, this is not my words, my advice, from my 
almost non-existent experience. This is the Word of God, and what Solomon and, in this case, Lemuel, we're going to look at tonight, uh, is telling us through inspiration about this topic of marriage. And so we're going to look at it from that viewpoint tonight. Uh, as we began uh, last week, uh, you might have said, well, Proverbs 31 is not anywhere on here, and we're talking about marriage. Well, that's where we're going to be tonight. In fact, that's the only place we're going to be tonight, uh, because there's so much there. I think it deserves uh, its own uh, section, if you will, in our series of studies in Proverbs. So we're going to be looking tonight at Proverbs 31, uh, 10 through 31, that section that we often term the, the virtuous wife. I want to throw out a couple of things for us to think about as we start this text. The first thing we need to think about is perspective. We talked a little bit about this last time. The whole book of Proverbs is written by men, right? Solomon predominantly. Also, you have the words of Agur and Lemuel and maybe one other person. I can't remember, um, but at least those three, although mostly it's Solomon. And as they are writing, particularly Solomon, he clarifies he's writing to his son. Uh, even here, although this is something that Lemuel's mother taught him, this is still directed to a man from a man's perspective. So, uh, ladies, you might be thinking, well, <laughs> is this just going to be a, you know, ladies, this is what you should do, and men are just like, ah, oh, yes, you know. Uh, there are principles here that go far beyond that. We're going to see that as we go through. Even though we do need to recognize that perspective, uh, this is, at its core, a list of principles that help us understand marriage as a whole, not just one side or the other. Uh, so that's going to be very important for us uh, to understand. The other thing, and I'm going to throw this out there at the beginning, there are a lot of opinions, if you've ever studied Proverbs 31, as to exactly how the author of this section, Lemuel, how he organized it. We obviously are not reading this in Hebrew, and I'm very thankful for that because Hebrew confuses me to no end. But in Hebrew, this is actually an acrostic, which means the first line starts with the first letter of their alphabet. The second line starts with the second letter of their alphabet, and it goes down from, as we would say in our alphabet, A to Z. So there's actually a very intentional organization here. There also may be a couple other unique things about it. There might be a couple other poetic elements to it. I honestly have not been able to discover exactly which ones for sure exist beyond the acrostic, the A to Z thing. And I don't think for our purpose it matters just too much. So we're not going to focus as much on that. I do want to mention it's an, an A to Z kind of list. This is who a, a virtuous woman is from A to Z kind of an idea. I do want to mention that, but for the most part, we're still going to be pulling principles out of this. We're going to be pulling uh, like ideas together throughout this text and learning from it in that way. So let's get started in verse 10. Proverbs 31 and verse 10. Here Solomon, or really Lemuel, I'm going to keep on saying Solomon probably accidentally. Here Lemuel, which by the way, we don't know who this is. Uh, this is just someone that uh, had words that were both inspired and included in the book of Proverbs. He is saying this, sharing something that his mother taught him about a wife. He says, an excellent wife, or some uh, translation might say a virtuous wife. Who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. Now, as we start that off, uh, perhaps you might be thinking of last week, but I'll ask the question anyway, what is an excellent wife? You're right, though. That is the same word. It, when it was translated for uh, the, the, the Jews in the first century, the word literally was manly. But again, we have to understand their culture. The idea that's being conveyed is not masculine in, in some weird way, but the idea of capable, the idea of strong. So uh, this is essentially saying a capable wife or a strong wife, uh, one who is fulfilling their responsibilities and fulfilling it well, who can find? That's essentially the idea. And he says, she is far more precious than jewels. 
why does Solomon ask who can find her as we start off uh, this section of Proverbs? It's not a trick question. It's a, what, just what does that mean when you say who can find this type of person? What kind of question is that? I imagine some of you husbands, you're, you're like, well, if we're going to answer it literally, I, I can find one, right? <laughs> My wife is that person. But he's not literally asking for an answer, right? He, this is a rhetorical question. In other words, he's, he's throwing it out there not to get an answer, but to make the point, it's difficult to find this type of woman, this type of spouse. So he's essentially saying, who can find her? She's rare, and she is far more precious than jewels. She's valuable. So as we start this section, he first wants us to understand a godly and capable spouse is very rare and immeasurably valuable. That's the, the idea, the principle he wants to plant in our minds from the very beginning. So now let's go down to 11 and 12. The heart of her husband trusts in her. He will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Why will the husband of this type of woman have no lack of gain? In the proverb, it doesn't spell it out for us, right? But we should be inferring from the proverb why will this type of man, a man who has this type of wife, have no lack of gain? I think last time we talked about that she worked by his side. Okay. Or was capable of being able to work by his side. Okay. Yes. He will have no lack of gain. Why? Because he's her husband. Lemuel is telling us she's the reason why he will succeed. Now, that doesn't mean he has no positive qualities himself, but Lemuel is pointing out, as we're getting into this idea of her husband, not only does the heart of her husband trust in her, there's this mutual trust, which we're going to come back to, he will have no lack of gain. In other words, this is something that will help him succeed in life. Why does Solomon point out she does him no harm in verse 12? She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Okay. Why does Lemuel? I keep wanting to say Solomon. Why does Lemuel need to say that? A lot of spouses do harm to their their other half, and that's not just wives, right? Again, most of these principles apply to both sides. We're simply speaking from a man's perspective, a mother telling her son what to look for. But most of these principles would apply in the same way to a woman telling her daughter what kind of man to look for. And of course, in our culture, uh, there's uh, differences in how we perceive these things as well. Uh, but the point of she does him good and not harm, well, there's an awful lot of marriages where the spouse is hurt each other. Not necessarily violence, although that does happen unfortunately as well, but neglect, emotional abuse, selfishness, all sorts of things. And so he's pointing out this type of woman, this type of spouse, she deserves trust. She earns trust, really. She creates more success, and she has the best interests of her spouse in mind. Look down at verse 23. We have something else as we see specifically the relationship between uh, the woman and her husband. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Now, I think we've mentioned before, but uh, just very briefly, in their culture, of course, we don't have gates 
at all really in our cities anymore, right? That's not necessary. But in their culture, you would have usually a wall or something like that, or, or maybe if you even didn't have a walled city, you'd still have some kind of gate along the roadway. And the, the elders, the leaders of the city would sit there and they would conduct their business. They would uh, hear complaints between people. They would try and resolve anything that could be resolved without going to you know, a full legal proceeding or something like that. Uh, and I say full legal proceeding, there were legal proceedings that would take place uh, as much as possible in that environment. So essentially, when she said, or when uh, Lemuel says, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders, this is a man who is in a leadership position in his community and well respected as a leader in the community. Why is he able to sit at the gate? Why is he able to have that position? Again, the implication Lemuel is making is she's the key to that. There, the, the success of the husband, the honor of the husband, ultimately, can at least in part be traced back to the wife who is uh, supporting him, making him able, uh, if you will, to do this. And I don't mean supporting him in terms of, you know, bringing in the income per se, but uh, the idea of being supportive to that end. So when we look at this first idea in 11 and 12 and also in 23, again, these principles are not exclusive to one spouse or another. Although specifically here, we do have some things that are more specific. I, I don't want to give the impression as we're looking at this that I'm denying that there are different roles for the husband and the wife, right? We understand that from especially the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. But uh, the idea of in general, a general principle here, in a healthy marriage, a husband or wife, right, owes much of their success to their spouse. It's actually interesting when uh, you read this entire section in Proverbs 31, uh, some people might read this and uh, especially uh, uh, those who have been influenced by some of the, uh, the ideas of today that uh, try and throw out everything the Bible says about marriage, some people might read this and say, oh, this is essentially the description of a slave. This woman is nothing more than a man's slave. As we're going to see as we continue through this, nearly everything that is stated actually lifts up the woman from even what the culture at this time would see her as. It's giving her far more credit, far more attention, far more importance than would often be given in this kind of culture uh, to a woman. Now, granted, right, this is King Lemuel, so we're talking about a queen here, potentially, but uh, even so, uh, this is still a lot, a lot of principles, a lot of attention given to the importance of uh, the wife, and as we think about the principles overall today, that's true either way. In a healthy marriage, both spouses are trying to help each other succeed. And the success that we do achieve as the husband, as the wife, is in large part due to the support, the help, the encouragement of the spouse. Let's move on to then to 13 and 14. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. Before we move on from that, what does it mean to bring your food from afar? Comparing to a merchant saying she brings food from afar, what, what is Lemuel saying there? Remember in their culture, right? You don't go to Walmart and get bananas from El Salvador right? You have to, uh, you're, you're very limited in the food that's available in the local markets and so forth. He's essentially describing someone who goes to great lengths to even find what is not readily available to provide very bountif bountifully for her household. Let's move on to 16. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. What is the fruit of her hands? Is 
it's the proceeds of her labor, right? Uh, we said earlier she works with willing hands. Well, if she works with willing hands, and we're going to see she's even involved in, in business, right? She's selling, you know, uh, clothing and things like that. Well, from the proceeds of that, she takes some of that and she continues on that process. She sees a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard with the resources she has gained by her hard work. Verse 31, or rather, verse uh, 18 and 19 of chapter 31. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Again, connecting back to she's like the ships of the merchant. She perceives her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. Descriptions, of course, of the uh, instruments they would use in, in textiles, right? In, in sewing and making clothing and things like that. What does it mean? And this might sound like a, a silly question, but I want us to think about it in their terms. What does it mean her lamp does not go out at night? Okay, good. <laughs> right? This is not, I flip on the light switch and I have light all night, right? This is not a culture, not a, a time period where it was easy to do work after dark. The sun was uh, what you relied on for a lot of these things. Usually, you go to bed when the sun goes down. Now, uh, again, we were looking at a proverb, right? Is this literally saying her lamp never goes out? She never sleeps? I mean, okay, she would die, right? I mean, just <laughs> that's not possible. The idea is she is willing to work even beyond when people would consider it normal to work. All of these focusing on uh, how hard of a worker she is. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Okay, what does it take, again, kind of trying to draw ourselves in this perspective, what does it take to sell linen or sashes, as it says in some translations? What does it take to sell that? Okay. In this time, it is not easy to find, just to find good cloth, for one thing. <laughs> but beyond that, it's also very, very hard to find dyes. And yet, fine linen and some of the things, uh, scarlet, as we're going to see in a moment, and purple, these are very rare and very expensive things. And if you're going to work with them, you better be skilled or else you're going to ruin it. And you've just wasted something extremely valuable. Now, again, this is in the context of a queen, right? I don't think all of us are working with, you know, I don't know what it would be, $500 a yard material. I don't know if there's anything that expensive. But, but you get the idea. Uh, I don't know that that exactly applies uh, in the exact same way to everyone. But the point is focused on her pursuit of skill, her, her willingness to work hard. And so all of these are complementing her, essentially, all these verses we've just looked at, complementing uh, this wife, this, this queen, on her work ethic. Now, number one, uh, that's, uh, even though these specific circumstances, of course, are different, uh, everyone can have a good work ethic if they choose to, right? But I want us to also think about something else before we move on from this that I think is very important, especially in bringing out the principle and not focusing just on one side of an application. If she's going to do all these things, if she's going to accomplish all this for the benefit of the household, for the benefit of her husband, for all this, what has to happen beyond her? What does her husband have to do? They have to agree. Okay, good. Uh, they have to agree, right? You could have a situation where uh, the wife, for example, is very, very capable of contributing a great deal to the house. And the husband maybe is stingy with their resources. Maybe the husband is uh, just distrusting maybe the husband is set on uh, she can't succeed or else she's gonna outshine me all sorts of different things like that 
This only works if they, I think you said, are, are, if he's supporting her. This only works if they're a team. This only works if they're on the same page. This only works, as it said in verse 11, if the husband truly trusts his wife and is willing to entrust her with a lot of these things. Now, again, that's going to look different in different situations. I'm not saying that this is biblical authority. The, the wife has to be in control of the finances and the bills or something. I'm not saying that uh, specifically. But the idea here is uh, there is no limit to what a hardworking spouse can accomplish with persistence. That's the main focus here, right? Hard work and mutual support. That last part is key. It's not highlighted per se in this text. But none of this is possible without that. And this, again, is a principle that, while specifically here is addressing the wife, is true of both. There's no limit to what a hardworking spouse can accomplish with perseverance and mutual support. Now, of course, again, we're dealing with Proverbs. When we say no limit, I mean, obviously, I'm not saying that, you know, you're going to be a billionaire just because you're both on the same page and are, t- are a team. That's not the goal anyway, right? But... The idea is how much can be accomplished if you work together and support one another in this type of way. Verse 15. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Now this is a tricky question. I'm going to ask it in a tricky way because I want to make the point. Who's the provider in this family? She, it says, she provides food for her household, portions for her maidservants. Now, let's take that. What do we usually mean when we say who is the provider in the family? The one who works, the one who brings the income, which is usually the husband, right? And I think there is a reason biblically to see that as an appropriate thing. Not that a woman can't work. I'm not saying that at all. But uh, the idea of him being the provider, that does make sense within the context of a biblical home, generally speaking. But that doesn't mean she doesn't also provide for the family, which is what he's highlighting here. It's in a different way. Could she provide portions for her house or for her maidens food for her household could she do that if the husband is not bringing food to the house to be provided to people well no she couldn't do that could the husband and the others in the household this would probably include you know servants and stuff in this case would they have anything to eat if the food was just brought in by the husband and just sat there well, no, both have to be working together. Both have to be fulfilling those roles. And again, that looks different in different households to a degree, and we understand that. But the idea is that both are working together to accomplish this. Verses 21 and 22. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. There it is, that scarlet that we talked about a second ago. She makes bed coverings for herself. I think some uh, translations say tapestries. The idea of, uh, again, fine uh, cloth, not just for clothing, but for other things as well. Her clothing is fine purple, or fine linen and purple. Again, extremely expensive. What is his point in emphasizing uh, this aspect? She's not afraid of snow. She clothes her household in scarlet and purple and linen. What's Lemuel telling us? Do you have to have scarlet and fine linen to survive? No. She's going the extra mile to provide for her family, and not just to provide, to lift the family up. To, to bring them to a higher place, if you will, than they would be before. Now, again, I don't want us to be thinking about this materialistically. The point is not they're rich, right? If you have marry the right person, you'll be rich. That's not the point. We're going to see that actually in verses 30 and 31. But the idea is she is working to better the family. And she's doing that by taking the responsibilities that she has seriously. A godly spouse 
takes their responsibility to the family seriously, and the family prospers because of it. Again, that applies to both spouses, right? Both the husband and the wife in a family situation have responsibilities. Some of those are very specific. Husbands have certain responsibilities from God. Wives have certain responsibilities from God. Some of those are responsibilities of the family at large that they have to decide how they're going to handle those. But both parties in a marriage have many responsibilities. And a godly spouse takes that seriously. And as a result, the family prospers. Let's look at 31, 17. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. And skip down to 25 as well. Strength, again, and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at, at the time to come. In these two verses, in these two parts of the proverb, what kind of strength is Solomon talking about? Or Lemuel, he was going to do it. What kind of strength is Lemuel talking about? I think there's really two answers to it. Physical. Do what? Physical. Okay, good. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arm strong. Why is she doing that? Well, so she will be physically capable of doing the things she's trying to do, uh, working in the way she is and so forth. But there's something else too, particularly in 25. Is the strength there different? Mentally, she's really strong. Okay, good. Why? Why Why do we know that from verse 25? You're right. Anybody who can laugh at something goes to come. Like, they're ah. not worried about it. They're like, eh, whatever happens, happens. Good. I think that's the key. Strength and dignity are her clothing. Where does he go from that statement? She laughs at the time to come. In other words, it doesn't matter what the future holds. She's prepared. She's ready for it. She's saying, bring it on. Not in an arrogant way, not in a, you know, I will go tomorrow and buy and sell. No, you should say, Lord willing. That's, that's not the idea. The idea is she is putting in the work. She's putting in the effort to where she's not concerned for the future. She's done her best. And that's all that needs to, that, that's all that need, she needs to be concerned about. Uh, not that challenges might not arise, not that problems might not come. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying not only does she pursue the, the skills and the physical ability to be able to fulfill her responsibilities, but she also has that mental toughness of whatever comes, we're going to meet it head on. Whatever comes, we're as ready for it as we can be. Whatever comes, we're going to meet it as a family head on and do whatever needs to be done. Marriage requires self-improvement and strength of character. Again, I almost cringe when I'm the one saying statements like that. That's not coming from me. That's the principle we see in this text. So I don't want it to appear like I'm giving y'all advice because y'all should be giving me advice, right? But from this text, the principle that is embedded here uh, in the inspired text, marriage requires self-improvement and strength of character. Again, from both parties, right? This is praising the woman who uh, meets this, uh, this positive quality. But, but we see many times, even in the Old Testament, certainly in the New Testament, that the husband also is expected to constantly improve himself, constantly strive to grow and show strength of character. So both of these, or, or both parties rather, uh, need to recognize this. All right, let's look at verse 20. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. What does this accomplish? It's a strange question probably, but why is it important? that this woman is ministering to the poor, is helping those in need. Why does Lemuel want us to know that about her? It's kind of seems like everything leading up to this one has directly affected her. But this one doesn't have anything to do with her. This is people that live outside of her home. Good. 
Good. This is... All, all of these efforts, all of these things that we're focusing on, she's doing this, she's doing that. Ultimately, how is she choosing to use all of this? We already said for the benefit of her household, but also for those outside of the household, for those in need, for those uh, who she can help in this way. That shows her character. That brings honor to her family, to her husband, as we already mentioned. That is a way also, especially think about, again, this is a mother telling her king or her son this, who's going to be king. So this is someone in a leadership position. The wife will also be in a leadership position. This is something that uh, she can do to minister to those that she is, you know, in a prominent position over, in, in a sense. And I, I think about, you know, as Christians, as we are trying to show love to others, there are ways that I can try and help others, support others, whatever. There are ways that Liz does that in a completely, you know, separate scenario that that I may not really even be in that scenario, in the position to do that. But working as a team, she's able to help these people over here. Let's say I'm able to help these people over here. We're working together to accomplish part of what we're trying to accomplish, which is sharing with others. And so you have this idea here of her demonstrating all of these qualities. Look in 26 as well. She opens her mouth with wisdom and, te and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Again, she is offering something to others. Who benefits from this? From a woman who offers wisdom and kindness, speaks words of wisdom and kindness. Who benefits from that? Everyone does. They can see God. Everyone, right? Uh, maybe the first thought, you know, if she's speaking wisdom and kindness, well, certainly you want a mother who does that, right? Uh, teaching her children, those kind of things. But I can think of so many uh, godly women that I have had the privilege to know who offered wisdom or, or, or reminded me of ways maybe I should be a little kinder to people. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to everyone she comes in contact with. A wise and loving wife, I'm going to be specific on a wife here, even though this is true of a husband as well, but a wise and loving wife blesses everyone around her. A wise and loving wife blesses everyone around her. Let's go ahead and look at 28 through 31. Our time is uh, almost up. Her children, this is the summary, right? Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Verse 29 essentially is what they say. Many women have done excellently. Same word as the very beginning, right? The excellent wife. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. This is probably the most quoted part of this. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So her, her whole family, her husband, her children are blessing her, are, are making it known. You are exceptional. And then Lemuel comments, he says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Is he saying charm and beauty are evil? No. He's not saying this is bad and this is good. But charm is deceitful. You can have someone who's charming, who's not a person of character, who's not a hard worker, who's not someone who is committed to another person. You can have someone who's beautiful, but certainly you can have a beautiful person who lacks character completely. Those two things, in and of themselves, aren't where the, uh, the true meaning, the true uh, root of a person lies. What is it? A woman who fears the Lord. Now, in this whole section, 28 through 31, really in, in 10 through 31, in this whole entire section we've been looking at tonight, but specifically in this last part, the conclusion, what is the main emphasis? What is Lemuel's main point that he wants us to leave with? He repeats it at least three times explicitly in these last four verses. 
All of these things are true about the excellent wife. This is uh, what she does. This is how she affects others. This is what she accomplishes for the family. What's the emphasis, the conclusion? She is to be praised. Three separate times, her husband praises her. A woman is, who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let her works praise her. Three different times, the exact same word, by the way, in the original language. Now, we can talk a lot as we look at this passage, especially, again, thinking from a man's perspective, right? This is written more from a man's perspective, thinking about the woman he wants to marry or has married or whatever. Oh, well, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should be doing this. You should be more like this woman here in Proverbs 31, right? I'm not saying there isn't room for all of us to grow. But what's the point? The things that she is doing that are things of character. The woman who is trying to behave in a godly way. She should be praised. Notice, she's praised by her family. She's praised in the gate. That means publicly. She should be given of the fruit of her hands. That's a reward. In other words, when she is working so hard for the family, she should be rewarded for that. That's the emphasis here. It's emphasizing the value. It's emphasizing the importance of this kind of person and ending with, and she should be praised for this. This is not a, an oppressive type of idea of, oh, these are all the things that a woman should do for a man. This is if two people are working together to create the home that God wants them to create, and someone is doing that the way they should be, specifically here we're talking about the wife is doing that the way they should be, they deserve praise. They deserve reward. Godly wife deserves to be praised and rewarded for all she does. And a godly husband will generously offer such. That's how he concludes. And we're out of time. Any questions or comments before we close for this evening?